Hello everyone and welcome to Jazz Dance History. Just as a FYI, um, this lecture is a little is going to be a little longer. Um, I do have some places where I feel like it would be a good time to take a break, but feel free to stop the lecture at any point and take a break because hey, it's a recorded lecture. You can stop it whenever. Here are your learner outcomes. What is jazz music and jazz dance? How are New Orleans, Chicago, and New York connected to jazz? Remember, we're always looking for those connections. How are vaudeville, the circus, and minstrel shows connected to jazz? Who are influential musicians and dancers? What ethnicities and social dances contributed to jazz dance? Knowing terms, the definition of terms like isolation, appropriation, syncopation, and what are some different varied approaches to jazz dance? When people from different backgrounds find themselves living side by side in a new setting, the result is often a fusion dance. This process is repeated several times in the Americas, being North Amer the continents of North America and South America. This quote was taken from Gerald Jonas in his book, which I use often in this course as one of my resources, Dance, the Pleasure, Power, and the Art of Movement. You're going to see this quote several times because, once again, this um, dance form, as well as modern dance form, our American dance forms are exactly that. They are fusion dance forms. So what is jazz dance? Jazz dance is an American fusion, yeah, or blend that was officially given its name in the early of 20th century, but I want you to think about it like if you, I'm going to use a food analogy, um, if I were to bake a cake today, um, the, the vanilla, if I was going to make a vanilla bundt cake, the vanilla that I'm going to use in that cake today journey started way before today that the vanilla had to go through a process so that it would be potent enough so i want you to think about that potent vanilla as the music and as the people so there were things that happened before we got to that 19th to that early 20th century mark um within jazz dance we see blends of appropriated and this is a, this is a two-way street um, between African American, European American, and Latin American dance forms. So the appropriated movement of, of these several cultures. It also includes traces from ballet and other dance forms from around the world because we know that ballet is uh, not an American dance form, right? Because we just went through that within our last, uh, not our last, but the one before, module. What is appropriation? So I've given you these terms, appropriation, syncopation, and improvisation. So appropriation is taking um, a thing from another culture and saying that it's yours or using it without their permission. So I'm going to liken this to um, plagiarism. If you were to answer your assignment, you're given an assignment and you... Um, go to a website, you cut and paste and put that website, put that cut and pasted information into your assignment without putting a citation at the bottom. That's the literal equivalency of appropriation. You're taking something without somebody's permission and not giving them credit for it. Um, syncopation is a disturbance in the and the rhythm and some of my music people might be able to explain this a little better than me but i think of it like stressing the non the normally unstressed rhythms so if i were to count one two three four one two three four that's just a basic four but if i was to count one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four that and is that space in between the two beats and syncopation is when you're doing something whether you're playing a note there or doing a movement in that space between the beats improvisation you're familiar with this because improvisation is just an unplanned sequence so when you are doing your social dances your the way that you socialize so let's continue to think of social dancing as the way that we socialize um the way that we interact with people um when that happens, when you're at a party, you 
I would believe that no one's going in there like I'm going to do this movement and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do that and then I'm going to count and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to like there, you, the music just comes on and you start dancing. So there's an improvisation. You're making it up as you go along, as you feel um, so, so moved by the music or by what's around you, you adapt and change. That is improvisation. So this idea of improvisation is something that's already natural to you. It's actually more natural to you in your dance world than choreography. Characteristics of jazz dance, you see once again that isolation. So um, in jazz as we know it now, there's a use of the flow of ballet with ballet vocabulary, but then there's these percussive spaces. There's articulation of the torso similar to what we find in uh, modern dance and this extreme marriage to the music. So in, I would liken this to say um, in the in the modern dance realm there is more space for you to move against the rhythm but in jazz it's more about in my experience it's more about your relationship with the music your you're in a dialogue with the music you are essentially recreating the music with your body movement so there isn't going to be moving against the music because you are essentially recreating the music in your body and the use of syncopation. Jazz dance is about a connection with music. It will continue to grow and change as the music does. Um, some people say that hip hop is just this, uh, the contemporary or um, today's present version of jazz because of that once again, that idea of that marriagement to to the music and the way that the body moves with inside in relation to the music. Because of that marriage to the music, because of that strong connection to the music, we have to look at and understand how the music developed to better understand the dance form. The music too um, is said to have be, have begun in the late 19th century and 20th century, but that's just a part of it. So I want you to continue to think of this. Um, let's use that iceberg uh, analogy where the tip of the iceberg is jazz dance as we know it, but the iceberg goes all the way, is very deep into the water, and there are so many other layers of things that contributed to jazz, dance, and music. So we want to look at those things that are below the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's characterized by a strong rhythmic understructure, a solo, and improvisation, right? Um, and a sophisticated harmonic idiom. Here's that quote again. When people from different backgrounds find themselves together, these fusion things happen. So let's put this into context as, as we're going into this iceberg analogy. Um, Let's begin to connect it some more with ballet and some other things that are going on in the in the world. If you think back to our ballet unit, there was, um, I'm going to use the quote, 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I mentioned the Moors being um, ruling over Spain and that when they were um, pushed out of Spain, that was the same time that Columbus was commissioned to find to, to come to the Americas, right? And um, so we're dealing with that same time to give you context. We're we're in that fourteen that fourteen hundred ninety fourteen ninety two, sheesh, we're in fourteen ninety two. And in fourteen ninety two, Columbus lands in Cuba. Although Columbus is given credit for discovering America, he learns he lands in what is Cuba. Now, um, so in 1495, he when he lands, he meets the Ar Aritos, and the Aritos, and I'm not a Spanish speaker, so I apologize if I am butchering these terms. Um, what one of the languages that the Aritos speak is Cubanica, hence the island being called Cuba. There are other indigenous groups and uh, indigenous nations there. Um, we learned this in our studies. I think I've brought up Australia before. Australia has over 800 indigenous nations. Um, the U.S. has over 200 indigenous nations right now. 
Um, so just this idea that there were indigenous people there and they did have customs, traditions, um, and things of sorts. During the 15th century, during the 16th century, so we're looking at the 1500s, Europeans began to bring slaves over from North and West Africa. So this is where we begin to see um, these fusions building within the music and within the dance forms because these people were meeting together for different reasons. Sometimes um, it's in a work experience. Sometimes it's during the war, like for example, the Cuban Independence War, people would meet in the forest. And when I say people, I'm not just talking about the soldiers, I'm talking about the people. The people would uh, meet and kind of relax there. And in their vibing together, we see the development of the rumba. We see the use of the indigenous instruments uh, of Cuba from the Aritos. We see the the instruments and the traditions of Europe coming, but we also see the traditions of Africa that have been brought over. So there's it becomes this space of blending. So Creole people, because I just mentioned that term, are people of mixed heritage. And Creole people can, depending on where you are in the world and what time, meaning um, the language is going to change and be descriptive of a different group, depending on a timestamp. Um, Creole people are a of mixed heritage. It's usually of European heritage that can be Spanish, French, or Portuguese with African or African American and an indigenous group. So you're going to have indigenous people, you're gonna have Creole people in Cuba, you're gonna have Creole people in Haiti, you're gonna have Creole people in Louisiana, you're gonna have Creole people in different parts of the world. And depending on, once again, depending on uh, the time that you're looking at will give you a better insight into what that term Creole and the location will give you better insight into exactly what that Creole means. So as the Creole in Cuba are beginning to push the music, so they have this rumba, they also have the development of dances like Makuta, um, which has a European influence. It's the first time that you see uh, partner dancing in what is Cuba. We have this development that is now being pushed by the Creole people. And this leads us into um, further into North America, I'm going to say, because it leads us into New Orleans, NOLA, the Crescent City. So the Crescent City, you see that picture at the top of the screen. It's called a Crescent because of its shape. Um, it was originally a French colony set, settled and founded in 1718. That area that we now would refer to as the French Quarter, excuse me, now uh, we were referred to as the French Quarter, and it was first settled as like an outpost city. So when you get there, you would see, or during that time, there were officials and soldiers. It was slaves and rivermen. It was a working city. It was more about work than about leisure and party that some of us might equate uh, with New Orleans now. Um, it wasn't until about 10 years later in 1728 that the wives of the men that were living there were actually brought there and they brought with them these little bags uh, of their things. Excuse me. Um, in 1803, it's not until 1803 that New Orleans becomes a part of the United States. So I want you to kind of think about that and conceptualize that when people talk about New Orleans being different and how things are happening, that's because New Orleans is already established as a city, but it's not a part of the United States until 1803. So things are different and things can happen in New Orleans that you don't see happening in uh, the northern parts of the U.S. So anything above, and I'm saying northern, but even Georgia would be northern at this point because Georgia would be a part of the United States, but um, New Orleans is not. So things are different because it doesn't have to follow the same guidelines. It also spent time as a Spanish colony. Um, so it was given the nickname many, Place of Many Tongues because by the indigenous people that lived in that Mississippi, New Orleans, Louisiana space because of how many people were in this area. 
So take a look at this list of people. We have the indigenous nations. We have French. We have Spanish. We have the Creole. We are, and I've given you an explanation of what Creole means. We have Africans. We have Germans. We have Italians. We have Anglos. We have Irish. And we have people from the Caribbean. The Caribbean being places like Cuba coming over, right? So that that music and things that were created, that rumba, the makuta, those those that information, that music and that movement is already coming into New Orleans. And um, you might be wondering, some of you might be wondering, why did I name? Why did I list out German, Italian, Anglo, and Irish and things like that instead of just saying white and that? is a very intentional thing because at this point when when New Orleans is established Irish people are not considered white yet Italian people are not considered white yet um German so th- they're understanding that these people are considered air quote others at that time for different reasons As mentioned, New Orleans is different than the United States. It's not a part of the United States. So there are things that are happening that are not necessarily affecting New Orleans. One of those things is the Stono Insurrection of 1739. So during this insurrection, um, some slaves are revolting. And um, they are only caught because... They stop at one of the places they have been stopping throughout throughout the process. But in one of the places, they stop and they sit and drink and they stay for too long drinking. It is then found out that the um, that the drums were being used to communicate the traveling along, like what was going on. They were using drums to signal one another. So I want you to remember this idea of language right so music dance it's all a part of a culture right so if you when you really understand the culture when you're a part of the culture you get so much more from these um experiences with their art forms their music and their dance so these these people that were running away and the people that were listening to the drums completely understood what messages were coming through the through the drums. As a direct result of that, there was a ban on drums. But this ban did not affect um, New Orleans and because New Orleans was not a part of the, uh, the U.S. at that point. So in New Orleans, slaves were still allowed to practice traditional, their traditional languages and, and things like that. Um, And they were also, you also begin to see that Cuban clave that, that was created during that time in, uh, in the forest and whatnot, you begin to see that influence and those drums come into the U S or I'm sorry, into new Orleans, you, you see it becoming a part of the music and dance culture there. This is noted when Benjamin Latrobe visits New Orleans in 1819, which by that by that point it is a part of the United States. Now, at a point, black codes are developed. And the black codes are developed in the late 19th century, which would be the late 1800s. And these at this time, now it becomes taboo for people of color to dance and drum or worship anywhere outside of Congo Square. So Congo Square goes by several names. You'll see them listed under the um, the caption at the top of your slide. And this is the place that Benjamin Latrobe talks about. This is the place, it's a device of power. Like you can only commune here. You can only talk, you can only sing, you can only commune in this one place. On Sundays, this is the only time that you can do it. Because of that, when in this space, you see the development of music, a different kind of music, because not only is this a space, have people been waiting to, to dance and to play music, but you're also seeing 
members of all of these different cultures that are present inside of um, New Orleans. You begin to see the the ground, the the foundations of what will later be called Juba, right? Juba is a is the American version of a, a dance called Gwiba. And Juba is also the name given to musicians and drummers that are musically or rhythmically inclined. So this is a great time to take a break if necessary. If not, we're moving on. So now we're past the Civil War. The Civil War ended in 1865, so we're... Um, Slavery uh, is written to have ended in paperwork. And during this time, we see the music and dance that was um, that was uh, created in New Orleans. We begin to see it travel to the rest of the United States via minstrel shows, vaudeville, and the circus. So another thing that I want to just drop in is like, not only is New Orleans super diverse, but during this time, most of the millionaires that are in the U.S. are in New Orleans at this point. So there's not there's a lot there uh, financially, uh, people wise, culture wise. There's a lot there. This is a long quote. I'm just leave it up there for a minute. Um. And just let you read that. The, the textbook gives you information on minstrelsy and on vaudeville. So the goal of these lectures is always to give you more information or information that is not offered, right? So um, I found this quote about the function of minstrelsy and uh, Benedict and Gottschild in her book uh, The Black Dancing Body talks about this idea of appropriation to approximation to assimilation and she directly speaks about that in relation to and says that the minstrel show is a perfect example of this because it is an example of black culture being appropriated meaning it's taken and it's put into an into a performance which is the approximation of it because it is performed by um by people that are not black and then it becomes assimilated into culture so much so that the minstrel shows become one of the first theater style performances um of the United States so the minstrel show becomes America's first theater art form and it uses black face to perpetuate African-American stereotypes. So stereotypes are gross generalizations that are attributed to a group of people. So for example, um, to say that people of color are lazy, which you can't group a group of people like that, um, especially when you consider that they were previously used for extremely laborious tasks. So to say that it doesn't work out, you know, so these um, gross generalizations that are placed on a, a group of people. After the minstrel show, um, I'm sorry, after the Civil War, we do begin to see black minstrel shows. And that might seem a little odd, um, but to put it into context, at this time in America, if you were a black performer, you had to wear black face in order to perform. I'm gonna say that again. If you are a person of of black of color, you had to wear black face to perform. As mentioned, um, the textbook gives you information on vaudeville. This link is provided in your lecture guide. This is a great documentary to um, to watch. So I'm gonna just leave that there for you.
another place that allowed this music to go. So the minstrel through the minstrel show, we see the jazz music and dancing traveling through different parts to different parts of the world. I'm sorry, different parts of the U.S. But the circus is also a thing that allows this music to go because once again, we're coming out of slavery. We're coming, um, so black people, African-Americans are just coming into the workforce and the circus provides a income. So artists would, um, would join the circus as a way to travel and as a way to, to make better money than they would if, if they stayed in their space and just did sharecropping or some other type of job. So as the circus is as the circus is traveling, the music is traveling and it's traveling and the dance is traveling and it's traveling because the art form is traveling. So there is um in the circus there was a a black musical tent and from that tent, you would hear spirituals, you would hear work songs, you would hear ragtime. So ragtime, while mostly played on a piano, is actually one of the precursors to jazz. So you would hear blues. And all of this is the like that melting pot, that like big crock pot or whatever for jazz music and dance. Because in this tent, the music is is growing and developing more. It's 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 um and so is the dance form. Master uh, Juba, Henry Lane is also hired by Barnum of Barnum and Bailey Circus to be a um, entertainer. It is in the circus that, that people of color are finding work. And sometimes they're finding work that is better than they would normally find, so for, or better conditions rather. So, um, you see bands coming in. Uh, there is the the Lowry band. They're allowed to to perform in the circus without blackface in 1931, and that might seem like oh it's 1931, but realistically, uh, the the last time someone performed blackface was in like the 1960s. So this is a this is a big deal for for um the black pop, the African-American population. And all of this has laid the groundwork for what we know as early jazz, that vernacular jazz, that vernacular ja jazz, think about it, vernacular language, the language of the people, the traditional that, so we spoke about this idea of folk dance, traditional dance, social dance, vernacular dance, they're all the same thing. It's just, uh, your preference for which term you want to use. So this traditional jazz is this older form of jazz. In that early 1900s, that that ninth, I'm sorry, in the in yeah the 19th century, excuse me, in the early 19th century, we see a social dance boom. So we um, also see the the first time that jazz is, has been printed in a magazine or a newspaper, like people knew what it was, but the people that didn't really know what it was needed something to call it by. That sounds kind of weird, but it's kind of like, um, okay, you're in a relationship, you have an interaction with somebody, and the two of you know what you are, you don't call each other by anything specific, but then somebody asks you like, oh, what are y'all? And you're like, oh, where? And then you start to think about it, like now you need to create a term to call it. Um, the people that were already doing the jazz knew exactly what they were doing, but this is the first time that we see in print the term jazz because now other parts of the world, other part meaning other parts of the U.S., want to have something to call this dance form and this music form. During the social dance boom, we see these animal dances come back, the turkey, or we see them being done in not just in the South. So the turkey trot, the grizzly bear, the chicken scratch, the camel. Now we've talked about animal dances before within our religious dance forms, um, but now we're seeing it not just as a spiritual thing, but as just vernacular, just social dancing. In 1914, the Vatican denounces it, like that turkey trot mm -mm, is inappropriate. And so is the tango, because this in this 
part of the century, we're also beginning to see the ballroom dancing, the Latin American ballroom dancing come into the United States also. In the 1920s, we see the familiar dances like, or um, the social dances rather than familiar, social dances like the Black Bottom, the Charleston, they're moving from the South to the North. They're changing a little bit. Um, and so they look slightly different because, you know, if there was a dance that was about a vegetable and that vegetable doesn't necessarily grow in the Northern state, it's going to look a little different. So it's going to change a little bit once it gets to the North, but these dances are moving, this movement, this music is moving with the people. And all of these dances and all of this music includes improvisation still. So now we're in Chicago. So we moved, we started in Cuba, we came into uh, New Orleans, and now we're in Chicago. So in uh, 1915, the Dixieland Band comes, and they play at this cafe for about six weeks. And they get a horrible review. And they get a horrible review. It's believed that they get this horrible review because people don't really know. People in Chicago don't really know at this point jazz music. So they can't relate to it. So think back to our five premises, right? The more you know about a culture, the better, the easier, the more in-depth um, experience you can have with its art forms, right? So... These people don't know jazz, so they're not, it is believed that, that that's the reason why they're having such a negative reaction to it. But a few years later, when Louis Armstrong comes to Chicago, he gets a much different response. And it's believed that it's directly because people are migrating. This is the time of the Great Migration, so people are migrating from the South to the Midwest and to the North. So now when he's playing in that audience, playing for that audience, that audience is more familiar with the music because for some of them, it is what they're, they, they know. Um, Chicago is also another place where we see blending, allowing for something to develop because black people, African-Americans, and white musicians, notice it's, it's still early, still 1917, so that, that idea of white people is not inclusive of the same group that we would consider white people in 2020. Um, they are meeting after the club closes and just flowing with each other, playing music, creating stuff, just like relaxing and allowing and improvising, right? Because this jazz style is is founded in improvisation. This kind of takes us into the Harlem Renaissance. So now it's like, it's the 1920s and um, there's a lot going on. Um, we in America have just experienced the World War I so this is that space after World War I, um, but prior to World War II. So the Harlem Renaissance is an artistic movement that is, um, is mostly happening in Harlem, New York. And it's a deliberate action by the African-American community to push back against some of the narrow stere negative stereotypes associated with African-Americans. So for example, if the stereotype was that African-Americans are illiterate, then the pushes that we're going to the NAACP and other places, we're going to give awards and scholarships out for people writing books. So there's a boom in literature. There's a boom in philosophy. There's a boom in arts because how else to counteract something but to have a positive action? During this time, um, UB Blake creates all types of uh, Broadway plays, and there's a decade of Black musicals. This is also when the Charleston is finally introduced to the uh, to New York. So the Cakewalk, which was a um, dance form that is the direct result of um, 
of slavery, um, a cake was given to the person that danced the, the best. So we have this idea of appropriated movement in that in the cakewalk, the slaves were actually making fun of how the slave masters walked. And then as it comes north after slavery, the, um, the people in the north are kind of making fun of how the people in the south are doing it. So you just have this making fun of trying to to do the thing, laughing at the thing, and it becoming something else. So the, the cakewalk is the first dance to cross from um, African Americans into white culture, but it is later that the Charleston makes it to New York. And we are finally at our tat. We made it, we made it, we made it. This is a three paragraph tat with more complete directions given to you on the actual Canvas website. That first paragraph, you're gonna talk about New Orleans. So remember that we're always thinking of dance as a physical manifestation of a society. So what was going on in New, in New Orleans? Why is New Orleans special? Think about its population, think about the function of the city, think about the people that were there, right? That's what you're talking about in paragraph number one. In paragraph number two, because all of that is that's the what's under the tip of the iceberg. In paragraph number two, um, you're going to choose an event and talk about how it directly influenced jazz. So that event can be the Harlem Renaissance. It can be the circus. It could be the minstrel show. It can be vaudeville, which for vaudeville, you're going to have to go to your, to the reading and speak to like the function of it, who was in the population of it, the structure of the thing and how it influenced jazz. And then in the third paragraph, you're going to watch a video. So you've done this before where you've watched videos of dancing and this one is going to be a little, I feel like it's a little easier. You are going to name three dance movements provided in a video because we talked about this vernacular jazz th thing um, and it's, you're going to watch the video, list three of the movements and demonstrate your mastery of based, meaning understanding the elements of dance, use based to describe those three movements. So three paragraphs, paragraphs are five to seven sentences in length. You, there is no need to number the paragraphs. Please do not number the paragraphs. And if you choose to include your base list, they need to be at the very bottom of your assignment. I hope that this was uh, helpful. I hope it, if you have any questions, you ask them of me prior to the due date of the assignment. And have a wonderful, wonderful day.